You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hello, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners, and welcome to Silver Screen Science. Silver Screen Science! This is our series where we talk about the science in movies that relate to the kind of science that we like to talk about. It's been a while since we did our last Silver Screen Science. It has. Earlier this year, a movie came out that we figured we were going to have to do a Silver Screen Science about. This episode, we are discussing the movie 65. Mm -hmm. Came out earlier this year in March of 2023. Directed by Scott Beck and Brian Woods and starring Adam Driver and Ariana Greenblatt. And featuring a bunch of uh, ancient creatures. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dinosaurs and dinosaur-like things. (laughs) Dinosaurs, quote, quote. Dinosaurs, things that are almost dinosaurs and things that wish they were dinosaurs. (laughs) If you've not listened to Silver Screen Science before, our mission, our goal, the reason that we like to do Silver Screen Science is to discuss how scientific concepts are portrayed on the silver screen. Not just the nitpicky stuff that the movie got right or wrong, Mm -hmm. but that intersection of science and pop culture. And this is a great movie for talking about tropes in paleo-related fiction, because this movie is just so full of tropes. Yes. Yes. We're going to have a lot of trope discussions to go into here. It's tropes all the way down. So this episode, we will be discussing the scientific perspective on the stuff in 65. If you're interested in hearing our personal thoughts about the movie, science aside, we will be releasing an episode called More Thoughts on Patreon for our subscribers. So be sure to check that out. Will, before we get into the sciencey stuff, And of course, before we go any further, this is your official spoiler warning. We will not be holding back. We will be discussing all the things that happen in this film. So if you don't want to hear any of that, leave now. I come back later. Yes. Well, before we get into the science, what happens in 65? So in 65, uh, we start with Adam Driver's character, Mills, whose daughter is sick with something. And so he takes what seems to be an intergalactic trucker job to try to make a bunch of money to help out but is transporting a uh, uh, cryogenically frozen people. Mm-hmm. It's never made clear particularly what it is for, so I don't think he's supposed to be an intergalactic human trafficker, but... I don't? Yeah, I'm not sure. We're not told what it is. Something goes horribly wrong when he enters an asteroid belt or, or a field of space rocks. Classic. Ship gets damaged. They crash on a planet. Only survivor, it seems, is a young girl, Koa, who is played by Ariana Greenblatt. And then they discover they are now on, to our knowledge, prehistoric Mesozoic Earth. And they have to survive as they try to get to the last remaining escape pod as they make their way through a dinosaur and and danger-filled landscape and fight many creatures along the way until they finally can get off-planet again. Right before it is destroyed yes. <laughs> by an asteroid impact. It is sort of the classic movie setup of what if space explorers crashed on an alien planet and then had to deal with dangerous monsters, except what if the planet was Earth? And I've seen like that concept thrown out in lots of, you know, Tumblr and Reddit posts of I would love to see a short story or a movie where aliens land on Earth, but like land in the savannah. And yep. are being hunted by hyenas and lions and run into a hippo. I've seen that concept thrown out there. This one was done with a prehistory perspective also yes. thrown into the mix. With dinosaurs. Mm-hmm. As usual, we're, we're going to pick a few main subjects to tackle in discussing the science of the film. Starting, as usual, with the creatures. Yeah. There are a bunch. So this movie takes place, ostensibly, on Earth right at the end of the Cretaceous, hence the title, 65 million years ago. Mm. More on that later. (laughs) And the characters run into a whole bunch of creatures on Earth, uh, many of which are dinosaurs, or at least intended to be familiar-esque dinosaurs. Yes. They're kind of capturing the... the there's just the base idea of like a lot of vibe. the vibe of a lot of dinosaurs. Like this may not be a specific raptor, but it's it's a raptor. It right. gets the the idea across. So we've got uh, raptor like things, some something Deinonychus esque. We've got something that appears to be Tyrannosaurus. Uh, they aren't identified in the film. Yeah, 
So the, Mills doesn't have like a Pokedex that tells him what the dinosaurs are. And that that is one thing that is interesting is from what we can tell, there's no instance of time travel involved in this film. So right. this isn't this, this a, is an alien yeah, species. This isn't a future human that landed on past Earth. This is just s- space people that landed on Earth 65 million years ago. Right. So they don't have any concept of any of these animals. Right. They don't have any, you know, names for any of them. So none of them get named or described by the characters. And I've seen online lists of what are those prehistoric animals that are appearing in the movie 65. And some of them seem fairly reasonable, like Tyrannosaurus or like identifications of some of the pterosaurs that mm-hmm, show up. Mm-hmm. Other, I, I don't know if there's been an official list put out by the people who made the movie yeah, yep. of like, these are the dinosaurs those are supposed to be. So I assume that a lot of the lists online are people doing their best guess yes. at what that seems like it's intending. I could be wrong. It may be a mixture of the two. Yeah, well, it's it's especially notable because often in movies like this, lists will come out and it's like, yeah, we got this through interviews. Right. And it's being shared around now on many sites. Almost all the lists you'll look up for this movie differ and disagree yes. with each other. They are not the same list over and over. So it really does feel like people are going, this is what I identified those animals as. So we've got a handful of things that are clearly dinosaurs. We've got at least a couple of different types of pterosaurs mm-hmm. or flying reptiles that show up. And then there's a bunch of other reptile dinosaur-esque things that aren't dinosaurs. Yes, definitely are not dinosaur for sure. Might be something related or just some other reptile group. Right. They look like, and I've seen them related to on the, the online lists, to crocodiliforms. Yes. So things like Rawasukians, there's the big one that threatens them toward the end of the movie that is often related to, but you know, by list online is often called a big Rawasukian. Yes. Which is the group that includes like Postasuchus and stuff. These were big, right. four-legged, quadrupedal, terrestrial predators. So they were some of the biggest predators before the dinosaurs became the biggest yes. predators. There was also, there were the, those weird long-necked, Thing. There, there was one that shows up by a river mm-hmm, that I mm-hmm. saw in one of the lists identified as Dinosuchus, which it definitely is not Dinosuchus. Yep, yep I saw that list too. <laughs> I was I'm like, like no, oh, all right. That's not what that is. <laughs> so there are these sort of un- unidentified, semi-identifiable, archosaur-esque yeah, creatures. I think I saw the, the ones that like are exorcism crawling down the trees. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think I saw one list refer those to like early dinosaur morph like yes, those quadrupedal right. uh uh things that are back in the triassic mm-hmm. close to dinosaurs but not quite dinosaurs yep yep so something either crockish or early early dinosaur ancestorish yes but uh some of them are also don't seem to quite match a known things and when i first watched the movie i couldn't have told you no. what they were they seem like they may and i think that it might have been wikipedia's synopsis that called one of them kind of a mix between Mm -hmm. this kind of dinosaur and this kind of crocodiliform. Well, it's like everyone that I saw when the trailer came out was talking about the galloping T-Rex because that's what that final Rawasukian maybe thing looks just like, still has the face very much of the T-Rex you just showed us, Mm -hmm. but has longer front limbs and is now galloping. Yes. Uh, So it, I, at no point did I have a moment of, Oh yeah, that's this. Later on, when I'd see a name suggested for, I go, oh, okay, I can see that. Right. That's the closest I ever had with a lot of those. So there are a bunch of reptile things of various identities. There's also some bugs Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, because you got to have big, scary bugs. Yep. Which uh, all of that having been said, the creatures of this movie are, I think, a really interesting discussion topic from the perspective of tropes in paleontology media absolutely these creatures are it's like they had a list of like what are what are a bunch of the tropes that show up in dinosaur media let's do a bunch of those yes first and foremost and if you've listened to silver screen science before and especially if you've seen the movie you know that this is coming uh monsterified left to right out the wazoo Uh, every creature in this movie is a monster that is out to harm the good guys yes uh the people and even if they're not directly harming them, they're scary and, mm-hmm. and seemingly dangerous. 
Even the bugs. Yep. Uh, which is a very classic thing for uh, uh, fiction to do. We are in the prehistoric times and everything is a murder demon. Well, and the, the moment that really encapsulated it for me is like you know, animals terrorizing people. That's pretty normal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then there's a scene where they try to save the little herbivorous dinosaur from a, a, a like a swamp or tar trap. Yeah. And then it is viciously torn apart by like a group of of small predatory dinosaurs yes it's like that one video that goes around online every now and then of people like they tried for a while and they saved a little rabbit yes yes. and then it runs across the parking lot and gets grabbed by a hawk (laughs) but it's like you know texas chainsaw massacre it's predatory violent yeah and so it's like not only did you make them monstrous because they're attacking people but even their normal behavior Yes. Of just preying on an herbivorous dinosaur you made as violent and horrifying and graphic. That they are monstrous from the moment they wake up to the moment they go to sleep. And then they have bad dreams. Yes. <laughs> like, you just made them so overly monstrous in every single scene. Yes. There's even a scene with pterosaurs where one of them gets yanked out of the sky by an unseen predatory pterosaur. Mm-hmm. Doesn't affect that. That doesn't come back to hunt them later. Right. Just to it's show you, just, you're not even safe in the air. The world <laughs> is a dangerous mm-hmm. place, which, as we've discussed before, is a really common trope in fiction that that portrays prehistoric times or yes. prehistoric lands, where it's this idea that everything is out to kill you. Yeah, uh, and, you know, the the question will come up in discussions like. Could a modern animal even survive in prehistoric times because it was violent and dangerous every at every turn? Exactly. Uh, which, of course, in reality, there's nothing about the Mesozoic that would have made it any more or less dangerous than modern times. Except, I guess, arguably that some of the animals were bigger mm-hmm. and therefore potentially a little more dangerous. But it is a way. Uh, it is it is a way of monsterifying. Uh, which, uh, and to, if that's the first time you've heard us use that term, we, we use the phrase monsterification to describe when movies and other media take creatures that are otherwise meant to be normal animals and give them traits that make them into movie monsters. Yes. This movie is very much invested in having monsters. Yes. And so they're very violent, they're hyper-aggressive, all that stuff. But beyond monsterifying the animals, this movie follows the trope of monsterifying the whole time period. Absolutely. That this, Which is this, a really common thing to see. Everything about Earth was turned up to 11 at this time. Right. You you crash landed on a strange planet and it's Earth. But even worse, <laughs> it's during the Mesozoic era. Yes. Uh, which shouldn't be any worse than crashing into the, the Amazon or something like that today. Yeah, and it, that's always an interesting concept because, like, absolutely surviving... In the, in the wilds of our planet is not a picnic. No, like there's no, dangerous stuff out there's, there. If you're a small animal, it is very scary. You know that's why they are skittish typically. Sure, <laughs> because <laughs> yeah, anything bigger than you might decide to eat you. Yeah, that would have been a cool <laughs> twist in the if they crashed, and then it turns out that these alien people are like a foot tall. Well, it's like, like th- now you're in trouble. That's why I liked Honey I Shrunk the Kids because it's like no no mm-hmm. that would be, if I was <laughs> uh, smaller than an ant. Absolutely, that is a monster movie. Yeah, insects going around that can just pick me up and got like that. That should be scary, right? But this is treating it very much that everything is just waiting to kill. It's got it's kind of the the thing that happens with Australia all the time with like everything they're just trying to kill. He's like, mm-hmm. also though, a bunch of people just live there, right? Like, so obviously not, right? <laughs> also, a bunch of other animals, yeah. Live like, there, and it's it's also yeah. just a normal environment. With animals a lot of us aren't used to right. and intimidate us. That happened to, a lot of them happen to be venomous. Yes. Uh, which is true about yes. Australia. No, it, it does have a higher than average. <laughs> but it, it, it's it's kind of got that weird thing of absolutely it would be a harrowing experience to suddenly be thrust into the Cretaceous. Yes. But n- no more than if you were dropped in the middle of, you know, pre-human Africa. Oh, yeah. Or even like, modern Africa. Yes, like without any... Yeah, Con- no, no civilization nearby Absolutely. to seek refuge. You you would be struggling, but it's not. It should not be any more scary than Earth is today. Yeah, and they definitely turn even the ecosystem 
Yes. Uh, up to well, that way. And it does the thing, and we absolutely mentioned this in other movies, where even the bugs are scary. Yes. <laughs> like, when the bugs show up, it's a problem, and it's dangerous for people. Yep. And and once again, as is often when I'm like, like you had to just make up a bunch of prehistoric weird bugs. Yes. Like, just... You know, just uh, big scary bugs. We're making dino bugs because everything bugs. needs to be bigger and scarier with more teeth. Uh, <laughs> it's the same thing they'll do when they just make saber toothed things. Yes. It's got that vibe to it. Yeah. The other thing that they're doing in this movie, which is another common trope, is time averaging. Yeah. Of creatures. If indeed those weird, not quite dinosaur things are meant to be early crocodile forms. Uh, those are things that lived in the early in the Triassic. Yes. Early in the Mesozoic, which would not have interacted with Tyrannosaurus and what we'll charitably assume is Deinonychus. Yep. Uh, also, Oviraptor or something like Oviraptor mm-hmm. is in here. I've seen it identified as Oviraptor. Oviraptor is from Asia mm-hmm. and Tyrannosaurus is from North America. So if that's the intended creatures, we're also getting mixing and matching of different parts of the world. Uh, which is another very common thing we see uh, in these films. When I was looking up lists of what prehistoric animals appear in the movie, on multiple lists, I also saw them list that there is a carcass at one point that I've seen multiple lists identify as woolly mammoth. Oh, yeah. Because I guess it has tusks with it, potentially. And and I, it didn't stand out to me when I was watching the movie, but I've seen it show up on a couple of lists. Yes, I've seen that too. I did not notice any skeleton that jumped out as mammoth to me. There were like giant whale-sized jutting ribs in one of like you yeah. when they're in like the the geyser field. Yeah, uh, there's a skeleton that's got that like just skull island. You know, a, a behemoth has has died here. Mm-hmm. But I didn't see anything. But maybe I I wouldn't actually be that surprised if. They threw a, an elephant skeleton in there. Right. So uh, it is It is absolutely doing, we're picking and choosing creatures from all over the place, yep. uh, from all different times, or making creatures up. Yes. Uh, if those aren't intended to be Triassic crocodiliforms, and it's not intended to be a mammoth or something, then it's, d- another common trope in prehistoric media is inventing monstrous prehistoric creatures. Yes. And like, to an extent, I definitely understand, you know, if you are kind of vague, we're like, all right, we're going to have a giant crocodile. We're not going to go so detailed as to go reference the Dinosuchus skeleton at the right. museum. But there were crocodilians There were giant there. crocs. There were mm-hmm. many species of big croc things. But I can understand that, you know, having a raptor, but not specifically making it one species. Right. Well, and scientifically speaking, that makes tons of sense mm-hmm. to go, yeah. This is one that just doesn't have a name. Yeah. It's a little different. We, there's tons of dinosaurs we personally haven't discovered. It is filling the niche of that thing in this movie. Sure. <laughs> I get it. This one, though, definitely has times where it's like, all right, but you 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 made up something for this scene. Right. N- not for this ecosystem. Like, right. You just this is this is the monster for this part of the movie. Yes, exactly. And then you you flavored it for the Cretaceous mm-hmm. and for the Mesozoic so that now it it felt kind of like it was in place. The other thing that's interesting to note about the creatures uh, from a paleo art perspective is that they are uh, very old school looking in many ways. Yes. Like a lot of them have droopy tails. Uh, Like a lot of the Mm -hmm. quadrupedal ones kind of are almost dragging their tail. They're very skinny. Yes. Uh, Very like uh, a term that's often used in the paleo art community is shrink wrapped. Right. That their Which skin the, is right up against the bones. Yes. Which is a is a trope that you know, that was something that was common during certain periods of paleo art history where dinosaurs and other ancient creatures would be reconstructed artistically with the skin is just right over the skull or right over the body without adding extra muscle mass that you have to kind of hypothesize what that musculature would look like. Yes, it's saying the skeleton basically at face value. Right. And then just coloring it in. Whereas more modern paleo art has leaned more into aiming for more potentially accurate reconstructions by adding in, you know, places where there'd be muscle and fat and making them a little bulky. Because very few animals are, is the skin typically just right up on the bone Right. Tightly wrapped around it. There are examples, but that's not the norm. Yeah. It's also something that shows up a lot in movies 
when they are monsterifying prehistoric animals. Yes. Because a head that is the shape of a skull is scarier. Yes, it is jagged and, and more angular. Yes. And pitted. It also gave them, and I don't know if this was intentional, but I did wonder, it gave them kind of a, a malnourished look because they were so... yeah. Just gaunt. Gaunt is the only word I can think of to describe almost every creature in the movie. Yes. Very, very, uh, well, skeletal. Yes. I guess. Exactly. And it, it made me wonder if they were trying to go for a, like, these animals are starving and rabid. Right. You know, or not rabid, well, they're, but They're like, super stressed by being surrounded by monsters all the time. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and, like, if that's what you were going for, for why they're desperately attacking yeah, the humans. I was, I was about to use that word, that... Often we'll see that with movie monsters, that they are unusually skinny and gaunt, because I think it does give that vibe of something that is desperate yes. and something that is unwell. Well, it's like, it yeah, makes them look ill. Seeing a wolf where you can see the ribs often has that moment of like, oh, no, what what are you willing to do to get a meal? Right. Are you more dangerous mm -hmm. because you're sick, you're not doing well, you're not going to act like a wolf would be expected to yes act. yes exactly so yeah i don't know that that was the intention but that was that was in my brain the whole time watching it of mm -hmm. or, and wondering if that was supposed to be like a commentary on the environment at the time or something like it, right. are you going with the idea and i'm sure we'll discuss it but like that things were worse at the end of the cretaceous that things were not doing well before the asteroid hit are all these animals in a collapsing ecosystem and starving and whatnot right which i did i hadn't considered that until this right before mm -hmm. you said it i went oh that there is an interesting scientific discussion to be had it has been hypothesized and debated yes that ecosystems may have been stressed to varying degrees leading up to the mass extinction event i would be a little surprised if that was their intention in yes, the movie absolutely because it really does just fit a lot of monster movie common practices because <laughs> because a, a, a and trying not to be offensive, that would actually be an out of place note. Well, with the rust of the stuff in the film, yes, <laughs> like that would be surprisingly <laughs> a science mindful. It isn't the the movie doesn't like we've talked about with a lot of other movies in the past. The movie is seems far more interested in creating a monstery, dramatic action environment rather than portraying a realistic representation of ancient times yes and it's a monster movie yeah that's, and it's a monster that, that's that's the point of the movie is that's to be, what its job is to do it is a very straightforward movie like crash on a planet two survivors you have to navigate a dangerous world in order to yep. escape sci-fi guns dinosaurs yes it's it's torok but with a spaceship yes and so the the other thing that passed through my mind in a similar kind of vein is especially since we don't explain how there's human esque people in space seemingly like right right assuming they're just another spacefaring species that happens to look like us right uh, yeah that and my assumption is that it's like star wars star trek yeah logic of like yeah there's just tons of people basically humans in the universe we didn't we didn't want to make them look like not people so they look like people sure uh we didn't want to spend time on makeup yeah. and stuff which yeah that's fine you know like you said star wars is, is famous for doing that they even finally just called them humans yep. <laughs> and just eh, whatever galaxy far far away humans uh but i have wondered if maybe there was some intent of like oh this is an alternate take on our galaxy right. is this an alternate history yeah this kind is of thing we we didn't develop on earth and we found it you know and it, it's different it's not the same earth and all of that isn't uh, to my m memory in the movie no it's not actually so it's, suggested but it's just i w that was the one thought i had of like that would be a response that would just kind of nip all those questions in the bud right like, well right. it's not earth it's it's an alternate earth in another timeline speaking of the environment that they're navigating another interesting thing uh, moving on from the creatures themselves is that this film also uh picks up on a handful of tropes that are pretty common in depicting prehistoric j just the environment itself the landscape yes uh it's very common in films that take place in ancient times to see a lot of natural hazards yes represented in this movie we get a bunch mm -hmm. you get 
Uh, like you mentioned before, there's a little dinosaur that is trapped in... I don't know if it's supposed to be a tar pit. That's definitely the the feeling. It sure seems like a tar pit. If not, it's like black quicksand or something. Right. And then I think the people get stuck in it again later. Yeah. Uh, Adam Driver uh, almost drowns in the, I guess, quicksand. Yeah, that definitely was supposed thing. to be quicksand. And so maybe that was tar and quicksand. And sure. Which well, is covering all the bases. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a, a very rare double feature of deadly pits. Tar is very rare. Yeah. And just in general. Yeah. So that, that's a twofer. We also get a field of geysers. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think we get a volcano proper in the movie. No, but we do get, hydrothermal activity or geothermal activity with these geysers that are of course uh hot enough to kill the biggest scary monsters yeah, the final bosses yep <laughs> <laughs> so we also have this representation of this other classic series of tropes is throwing a bunch of hazards in the environment yes which is pretty common for like a lot of jungle adventure yes. films of you know quicksand and and crumbling cliffs and just the or the landscape is even against you yes uh and tar pits are a very f- popular thing to yes. be depicted especially in ancient environment representations even though yeah you know, and, and it obviously uh, almost certainly because there are famous ancient tar pits yes even though those are very restricted in terms of where we actually get evidence for them and i'd assume that's where a lot of that inspiration for making the ancient environment deadly is the fact that a lot of our information about ancient environments came from deadly events that happened to ancient organisms yes and caused them to be fossilized tar pits and cave collapses and and landslides pyroclastic flows Mm -hmm. and all sorts of stuff and you're like we have evidence of extinctions caused by or, or associated with massive volcanic events so it makes sense that there's that association in our mind but it does, it's kind of that that issue of like when you see a picture of the savannah and every single African animal is depicted in the picture. Yes. It's got that of like, <laughs> all right, but these weren't happening every day. These these were still as rare as they are now. Right. This, but, this is an image that's meant to be like, a, can you see all the animals yes. on the savannah? But you're not actually going to get a photograph that's, like that. That's not what the savannah is ever like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it's a weird... It's a weird conundrum because it's it's it makes me think of the cartoon thing of like we were all afraid of quicksand as kids, but yes. <laughs> I've never had to deal with it once in my life. Well, and it 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 seeps out of movie stuff uh, when uh, I've had this happen when we talk about ancient environments. This yes. happens at the Gray Fossil site. It's happened at other places I've talked about. One of the most common questions people ask is point points at fossil site and goes. How did all these animals die? Yeah, what killed what, this many animals? Ex- yes, exactly. What event happened that meant that there are all these animals here? And then it's an unexpected answer to explain that, though, this is just an ecosystem. Yeah, it's just the normal stuff that okay. kills animals. This is a site that was collecting remains over hundreds and thousands of years. There are tons of sites that mm-hmm. are an event that happened, but that's not always the case. Yes. But I think that you make a really good point that those kinds of fossils that are dramatic and informative absolutely skew our perspective on how dangerous an environment ancient times were. Well, it's uh, I've heard similar comments when it comes to like people living near volcanoes and like we think to Pompeii, but it's like, but volcanoes are not just erupting every day. And nowadays we can monitor them like that. That was a very rare event. Right. In history so it's it's not you can't just apply that to every situation that uh that could happen yes and then of course uh speaking of uh, environmental hazards of the late cretaceous the movie also features uh the asteroid yes which comes in as like they pass each other uh, they, yeah, they, they really the do planet <laughs> like well because it's it the setup for the movie and again at, as a premise for a film i 100 percent understand why you do this is what if you crash landed on a dangerous alien planet? What if it was Earth? Not only that, what if it was Earth during the Age of Dinosaurs? Not only that, but it's 12 hours before the asteroid at the end of the Cretaceous lands and causes a mass extinction. Yes. So not only are you in, if you manage to survive the quicksand and the tar pits and the geysers and the monsters, a, a cat, an apocalyptic event is about to yeah, happen. You're, you're also on a timer. Yes. 
Uh, which, I, I mean, the documentaries do the latest Cretaceous yeah. all the time. It's the most famous moment of the Cretaceous is the last moment of the Cretaceous. It, is, it Yeah, it is by far the the easiest, most dramatic way to end a discussion of the Cretaceous. Yes. <laughs> like, well, and also you get to have what you just mentioned is that they literally do pass the asteroid yeah. on the way out. <laughs> and they make eye contact. Well, and it's not only did you land on Earth when the asteroid's about to hit, you landed <laughs> yes, oh, no. uh, apparently in the Yucatan. Yeah, on, <laughs> you, on the side of the planet that you need to be. at grounds, like the asteroid is above you, yes. and it is coming right down. I, I, mean, I had <laughs> forgotten. Yes. Yeah, no, you're right <laughs> <Yep>. there. <laughs> yep. Which also actually does restrict what animals, I don't believe T-Rex lived down in the Yucatan. Oh, that's a good point, yeah. Um, uh, so, but once again, it's an action dramatic movie. Yes. And it also, uh, as you pointed out earlier, the reason the spaceship crashes uh, is because they go through an unexpected cluster of space rocks, mm-hmm. which, I, as I interpreted it watching the movie, seemed like it was meant to be, yeah, you went through the field of rocks that are headed towards this planet. Yes. And as far as the science of the asteroid, I don't have a whole lot to no. say. It's there very briefly. It's a big rock coming down toward the surface. They got they they uh the entire movie they have their supercomputer from the ship to give them info about like how from the from the escape pod they are but also it detects the incoming asteroid yes uh and says yeah you have this much time till a catastrophic event occurs uh so they they are aware of it because of that which is one of the benefits of using something like that as as kind of cliche and obvious as it is it's a very effective dramatic device to say an event is about to happen you all in the audience already know what the event is yes you've heard of this absolutely yeah that's what's coming we don't have to explain the big threat here you're you're using something that people are already familiar with and that ticking clock is a a, a tried and true tool of absolutely action movies and scenarios a a, a doomsday clock exactly you know literally (laughs) uh so yeah it's it's one of those where i it it makes sense but it it really does add to the pile of tropes. Yes. That's that's really the and thing that our sticks to again. me about it of, you know, we've, we've done our tropey dinosaur stuff, we've done the tropey environment stuff, the time stuff, and we're going to do the asteroid, like, just yes. another yes. to the the pile. All the stuff. It's all the dinosaur stuff. And speaking of tropes of the late Cretaceous, mm-hmm. uh, we absolutely have to mention the name of the movie. <laughs> Yeah. The movie is called 65. Nothing else. No subtitle, uh, no additional. And it's just called 65. Just those two, those two digits. And in the movie, when they crash land, the title card says Earth 65 million years ago. Yes. And this is, I for me, I think that this is really fascinating for two combined reasons. And we've discussed this on the podcast before, not too long ago. One is that that's scientifically inaccurate yep the asteroid impact that ended the cretaceous happened around 66 million years ago yes uh 65 and i saw when the movie came out i saw a bunch of tropes and and especially people on social media in paleontology and paleo art communities talking about like oh adam driver's gonna have to contend with terrifying (laughs) early paleogene mammals that (laughs) survived the asteroid impact can he handle leptic titium (laughs) and someone made i don't know who made this someone made a edited version of the trailer that replaced all the dinosaurs with like leptic titium and little (laughs) little little early paleocene mammals Um, like edit scenes from walking with prehistoric beasts (laughs) yeah yeah and i think it was it it may have been stuff like that beautiful um which you know in the grand scheme of things is not you know i don't bring it up to nitpick it uh and we've talked about the the sort of history behind that age that for a long time the best estimate of the end cretaceous was a roughly 65.5 million years ago. Yes. And it became just sort of common parlance to shorten it to 65 million years ago. And that showed up in all the books. It showed up in all the things. Jurassic Park's tagline was an adventure 65 million years in the making. Yes. And now over time, especially the last couple decades, we've refined that date to find that a more accurate estimate for the end of the Cretaceous is... 66 million years ago and actually i think a little bit 
over 66 million years ago. Mm -hmm. Which means that 65 is now technically a little bit off. Mm -hmm. But that, that it's that is now farther from being correct than yes. Being, uh, now you're not half a exactly. million years off. You're a full million years off. And what I think is really interesting about them using it the way that they did is that you can get away with that because that number is so culturally recognizable. Yes. Like that number, which was, uh, I, I won't say it was inaccurate, but it was, you know, it was a shorthand yeah. of the, or the, the earlier estimate went on to become a extremely widespread recognizable time point in earth history. When you say 65 million years ago, it is fairly reasonable to assume that your audience is going to know what you're talking about. It is culturally recognizable. Yes. As the end of the age of the dinosaurs. Yes. Which makes it another one of those tropes. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the trope is a number, mm -hmm. which I just, I think is a really interesting feature of this film. Well, and it's, it's got, it is extremely interesting because it's got a lot of layers to it for me of like, as you said, you know, the whole history, the famous number was simplified. So already, you know, if you took a time machine back to exactly 65 million years ago, right. you would already be off. Just paleogene mammals. Yep. And then we have since realized that the more accurately adjusted date is even farther back. Yes. So you have the, the, the wrong time for the event you're wanting to center your movie around. But had you named your movie 66, no one, people would have been like, is this like a, a, a exorcist? Like... Right. Is this part two of an exorcist thing? It's a remake of Buffalo 66. Yeah. Like what? Route 66. What What right. are we doing here? Yeah. No so one would have gone. If dinosaurs, if you had made it technically more accurate, it would have been less recognizable. Yes. So like it, it's that it's that weird balance of I absolutely understand. You know, it's it's why like Megalodon, mm -hmm. its genus name has changed what genus yes. the shark is in. But we keep using the the epithet megalodon as just the shorthand for the shark, even though we're moving it around who, which shark we think it's most likely related to as we continue to study it. We're not sure which group of sharks it really should be in. But for a discussion, we're just going to call it megalodon because we don't want to have to keep re-emphasizing otutus now, otutus, otutus now. Right. Now, megalodon, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Well, And it's a similar point to the, the reason that dinosaurs often change so little yes. in our popular culture because it's one of the reasons why the Jurassic Park model of dinosaurs has stuck around so persistently mm -hmm. is that in some cases, if it doesn't look like the Jurassic Park version, people might not know what it is. Oh, yeah. Like if I just pop, you know, early on, especially popped out a fully feathered velociraptor, right. with fully feathered life size, correct sized and, and narrow snouted. Right. If they had put that in the second Jurassic Park movie, yeah, people would have been utterly confused no, by it. They would not in any way be like, oh, so this is the first dinosaur, the ones from the first film, right? Just now. Right. Re no. Even if I just showed you in person, they'd be like, all right, what dinosaur is that? You already know its name. And that's not to say that they couldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. uh, they absolutely could have, but they couldn't have done it and still gotten the recognizability yes. of that f dinosaur that had become famous from the first movie. The title of this movie is one of those really interesting instances and it it you know we are now into the 2020s and that 65 number is still going strong well and it, it it's where it feels like a very nice point like mile marker for the intersection of science and film mm -hmm. because from a film perspective absolutely you use 65 it's oh, yeah. recognizable it's catchy it's ends in a five which are always nice yeah, numbers 65 is just an easier mm -hmm. it's a nice it's not a round number no. but it's a it's a round number or an even number yeah. but it's a the way that fives are nice yeah. it's a nice five that's how many base. fingers we have it we like fives it is you know famous it gives you connections to films like jurassic park with their taglines yep. but if you were to try to be accurate, you would have needed exposition to explain that accuracy, yes. which like, is the same thing if, with like updated dinosaurs. If I want to show you the newer form of a dinosaur, I have to say, let me explain really quick right. why it looks so different from what you were expecting when I said, here's Velociraptor and in comes Velociraptor. Now, right. before you all jump me, and here's why it looks different. It's funny because like I, I was thinking, as you said it, if I were on the production team, like if I were an advisor for this film and they had said, hey... We're going to name the movie 65. 
And I might have said, all right, that's technically inaccurate. It would be more accurate to say 66. If they had then said, should we call it 66? I would have said, absolutely not. No, no one's going to go see it. No, it you it, should it, give it a, a title that's not a number yes. if you want to be accurate. That's it, the way around it. Exactly. You, and very much the same that if I were an advisor on a movie now and they were like, cool, we want to have a velociraptor that is a very accurate velociraptor, but we don't want people to be confused. What should we do? My answer would be don't call it Velociraptor. Yep. Use a different dinosaur. Yes. There's tons of them. There's tons of small feather dinosaurs. Yeah. Unfortunately, the name Velociraptor has all has already achieved a cultural image. Yes. Pick a different dinosaur with a cool name and it pick one that's the same size and just use that one. Or use Deinonychus or, you know, you 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 do have to kind of balance mm-hmm. that. Because as much as fun as it would be to have a movie that comes out and goes, all right, we are aiming to change the cultural perception of Velociraptor. Here we go. We're going to go for it and do it. Yes. A movie doesn't feel like the place that that's going to happen. Yeah. Uh, Because, A, people go into movies with certain expectations, but also no studio is going to sign off on that. Yeah. No studio is going to be like, no, the that's just going to confuse people. Yeah, you and and we're not probably going to be as keen on going actively against the history of Jurassic Park. Right. And, and then that's <laughs> re- like if you're going to pit yourself up against any movie. Yeah. That's going to one of the ones on the bottom of your list. So it's it's an interesting dilemma of you're absolutely right. The way around it is you'd have to choose a different title. Mm-hmm. And then you could have just, you know, the only reference then to the year would have been when that the title card came up and yeah, said yeah. Earth sixty-six point zero three nine yeah million years ago, and then let people Google it. A, you, you know? would have had some people that went, "Isn't shouldn't that have been sixty-five? And then would have Google and gone, "Oh, well, what do you know?" Yeah, yeah. But most people wouldn't have even clocked the. All right, yep, Earth. I already know this has dinosaurs in it. We all saw the trailer. Right. It's, it's so. But then it would have you would have lost every bit of appeal for that time. Absolutely. So you, you would have had to just say like the Cretaceous yeah, period or something like that. Exactly. So you you lose all that marketability. So it's it's I completely understand why those choices were made yeah. from a film perspective. I get it. I've even had those moments before when someone throws out sixty five. I'm like, all right, I, this is not the time that I need to correct you. Yeah, I get it. And you're close enough. Like you're close enough that you're yeah. in the right general age of Earth. You're not just saying. Yeah, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Through the mists of 40 million years. Yeah. You're sent, you're, you're real close, and this is a fairly recent update, so unless you're keeping up to date, I'm not surprised that you're like, that you've missed this somehow. No. It's, it's a weird one. It's very interesting. Yeah. So this is a movie, it's, it's a very interesting movie to talk about, because on the one hand, there's not a whole lot to this movie sort of in in terms of scientific discussion that's new a lot of the you know again it's recycling a lot of common tropes yes it's got kind of all the skull island you know king kong stuff with absolutely just just a little bit more a little bit less just full-on monsters yes but talking about those tropes is really interesting Mm -hmm. and sort of discussing not only sort of where they come from and how common they are but as a little update of Yes, it is 2023, and we're still doing these yes. things. Now, if you've listened to Silver Screen Science before, you know that, as I mentioned at the top, our general mission is to discuss the science broadly, that intersection of science and pop culture, and not just to nitpick stuff that bugs us in the movie. Yep. However, nitpicking stuff that bugs us in the movie is a ton of fun. It is. So we always like to set aside a little section right at the end of our episode that we call our mini rants, where we get to pick a thing that just made us upset mm-hmm. about about uh, typically the science or science adjacent things in the movie. Will, please mini rant. Yeah, we we referred to this, uh, a part of this earlier on with the fact that they made up monster bugs. Yep. In a scene, they decide to settle down in like the the inlet of a cave. Uh, like just just in an, the outcropping leading in to a, a cave area, and they go camping there. And then in the middle of the night, uh, Adam Driver's woken up by like the the proximity alarm saying something's coming nearby. Yes. And this is our first like glimpse of like oh a, 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 a tyrannosaurus is on your trail. But when he wakes up, he also finds out that Ariana has been attacked by a parasitic mouth insect 
Yes. And is like choking on this. It's basically those tongue isopods that uh, uh, take over a fish's mouth, but just some grubby thing. He uses some mouth insect popping device. Sure, sure. That he pulls out of his space utility yep. belt. Points it at her mouth and then the bug just goes thump, and just pops out and then she coughs up all the, the slimy goo. It was just goo. evidently exuding <laughs> like a lamprey. And they're like, A, what is that? <laughs> what are you doing? What is that what thing is, supposed to What be? is this bug? It, you just make up some like almost softball sized parasite like this thing had this is like fist sized mm -hmm. how big the thing was it's not just a bug this is massive right and it is never referred to later on in the film it is just a thing that is also happening while they're being approached by the t-rex they solve it before the t-rex gets there so it's not like he has to deal with that while they just were like also mouth bugs yep there's just one more monstery part of the environment so it's just it's so slapped on to the scene <laughs> it's it really <sighs> does feel like someone in the production was like hey i learned about yes. these uh, isopods that live on fish tongues let's do that <laughs> well the way i picture what if that but <laughs> in our movie is like th that that coming up of like man i saw this just the other night while they're all having like lunch and then it's just all them going <laughs> ooh, ah, ooh. oh man just put okay. it in a movie great that's oh, the reaction ooh, we want ooh, ah. <laughs> well, uh, what scene any... we should put in i don't know when they go to sleep they didn't have, <laughs> they didn't have any other major gross scenes yeah they needed a gross moment yes. in the movie a body horror to... moment yeah yeah exactly and it's yeah it's it's <laughs> i I, it, it was just, I was so confused of like, what is going on? Was this supposed to be something we let up? Like, was this supposed to be the annoying bug they were dealing with earlier? Is this, is this pertinent? This is that bug's brother. Is this going to make like this scene more tent? Nope. You solved it. That bug's like, I did. You killed, <laughs> you killed my brother. And now I'm coming for you. <laughs> he took out Tony. I let the T-Rex know that you're here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I sucked him out of the night. My job is done. <laughs> you may kill me, but my task is already complete. I may complete. have lost the battle. <laughs> Ugh. My mini rant is not directly related to the science -y stuff that we have talked about so far. This is not the first time on Silver Screen Science that I have had a mini rant about language. Mm -hmm. In the movie, so part of the tension between the characters in the movie is that Adam Driver's character and uh, Ariana's character don't speak the same language. Nope. Uh, Adam Driver is speaking quote unquote English, mm -hmm. uh, common, it's speaking basic. whatever. Basic. Yeah, basic. <laughs> uh, he's speaking whatever language you see the movie in. Yes. And then uh, Koa speaks whatever the alien, it has a name, but I don't remember what it yeah, is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this alien language. And that just adds to the drama and the tension because they can't communicate effectively with each other. And there are a bunch of times in the movie where he's like teaching her certain words, like he'll say words and then she'll repeat it. And she kind of, kind of picks up a handful yeah. of these words. A thing that happens several times in the movie is that he will like point at something or say a sentence. And I don't remember the specifics, but he'll be like, here is family. And she'll go family. Mm -hmm. Or he'll be like, we're going we're taking you home. And she'll go home. And I'm like, how does she know which one is the word? Right. Yep. That's not, that's not how language works. He, he said a bunch of sounds and you are very conveniently able to pick out the specific parts of that bunch of sounds. Yes. That were the word that was important for you to know in that scene. If I spoke another language and I said, this is where I live, you wouldn't be able to go, oh, live. Yeah. That. that Though that part of the sentence obviously is a distinct word, right? Yep. I, it's a it's an extremely this is what mini rants are for. Mm -hmm. It's an extremely small thing. Every time it happened, I went, "No, that's not. Nope. You're listen, movie. You're yeah. breaking my immersion. I, <laughs> I'm having a hard time believing that these are actually two people that don't speak the same language." No, I actually had the same thing of just like yeah. <laughs> too many moments of it being like, "Oh no, I said English at you enough times that you got it." Right. The the meaning inherently makes it through because it's English and obviously you will eventually get it. Right. Which movies do all the time of like. Yes. It is another trope. Mm hmm. 
I always feel a little weird when we do one of those movies of like, we have the English speaker and then the other language doesn't matter speaker. And they're going to effectively be a mute for this film since we're never going to translate them. Yes. And the only time they will speak that we can understand them is when they finally pick up they the got, language they got it. that the, the we've correct, been the correct language. forcing on. Yeah. The language of the protagonist. Yep. And yeah, this one does that a number of times. And I had moments of like, well, that sure was convenient that you communicated that complex concept real yes. fast. <laughs> <laughs> maybe she's just a super genius yeah she's she's a, a, a savant with language they had a babel fish on that <laughs> spaceship on the way in that was the other thing of like seriously you have a computer that can go oh by the way there is an asteroid this many kilometers across yeah. heading toward the earth at this speed but it can't translate this i don't know what she's saying pr- which <laughs> and it seemed like it was it was meant to be like he knew what language yes. it was i yeah. think doesn't he like he reckon he says recognize- i don't speak and says like the, yeah, I think he recognizes the language. Mm-hmm. Or so, at least, like, what people it's from. Like, Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I didn't download that before, and we don't have Wi-Fi listen, now. This was a long time in the past. Technology <laughs> hadn't gotten quite to the right... <laughs> well, it's, you have to pay extra for that language pack. It, that's not... <laughs> that's right. There's yeah. a paywall. And he's trying to save up money <laughs> yeah. to save his daughter. He doesn't have... It's, he, yeah. didn't, he can't This is why uh, technology should be free. <laughs> But it saved us a lot of trouble. Listeners, thank you for joining us for this episode of Silver Screen Science. This movie has been a whole lot of fun to discuss, even though the science leaves a lot to be desired. It is. It is very much inspired by science. Sure. (laughs) I'd say. If you are interested in hearing us talk about our personal thoughts and experiences as just moviegoers, We will release, uh, as usual, a More Thoughts episode for our Patreon subscribers, where we'll we'll leave the science at the door and you can listen to us talk about how we really feel about this movie. (laughs) (laughs) There will be more silver screen science in the future. Will, you mentioned uh, a a prehistoric animal during this discussion today (laughs) that also got a movie recently. Yeah. Yeah, there may be uh, there may be another silver screen coming up sometime. Yeah. Uh, once it's out of theaters. Yes. <laughs> we don't have to pay a bunch for it. Yes. We'll see. <laughs> anyway, we return you now to our regularly scheduled podcast stuff. Thanks for listening. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and check our WordPress blog for pictures and links after each episode. Huge thanks to our patrons whose support helps keep this podcast running and who get access to bonus goodies on Patreon. The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome, which we found at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope you'll join us next time.